We are so glad you're here. Thank you for choosing to be with us. Man, I am absolutely delighted. I know it's a, it's a memorial weekend and people are camping. People are away on trips. Some are on cruises. We say hi to all of you who are catching us on Facebook Live this morning. We welcome you to our service by way of video and by way of the internet. And we thank you so much for being a part. My wife had the opportunity this weekend to do some adulting. Her nephew got married and I was one of the officiants and we were helping out with everything this weekend. And for the first time in a long time, we really got dressed up. So we got a picture for you here of me and Joanna adulting this weekend, right? <laughs> Handsome couple, right? At least a half a couple. Handsome half a couple. Anyway, I just wanted you to see that we, we can dress up from time to time. I'm getting a little bit of echo here, guys, so I work on that just a little bit. Anyway, so glad you're here for Memorial Weekend. We honor our veterans, and we honor those who have fallen uh, in service and we thank you. I know we've honored you. We've had you stand and we've prayed for you But I just want you to know I'm thankful I'm thankful that the NFL came to their senses this year And now the rule is if you don't stand for the singing of the national anthem stay in the locker room I think that's a good move right there In fact, if they're not going to stay come out of the locker room for the national anthem I think they should just stay back there the whole game Yeah, amen. We, we honor we honor our country. We honor our flag we thank God for you. For those of you who are just joining us, we're in a series called Adulting. We're looking at six building blocks to being a mature adult. And so we want everybody to kind of make sure that you catch every message. If you have to be away for some reason, uh, we need to find out. Uh, you need to find out what message you miss. Go online. You can catch it on our website and uh, check it out. Uh, first couple of weeks were character. We talked about how we need to be changed from within. Our character is much more important than our image. And so we need to make sure that we're working and God is working with us from the inside out. The second week, last week we talked about priorities, big rocks first, that we sometimes don't prioritize the most important things in our life. Uh, am I the only one getting the echo? Guys, are we working on it? We're gonna, we got a big e echo coming. So we're work, trying to figure that out, guys. Sorry for us. We, we, we practice. We go through everything. And still, you, ne you never know what can happen. But uh, we thank God for the tech team that we have that works constantly on these things. So today we want to talk about purpose. What is our purpose? And uh, sometimes you just don't feel like adulting. Sometimes adulting. We say this message is not just for any age group, uh, from millennials on to the greatest generation that ever lived and for all the, uh, the groups in between. Uh, we want to learn how to be better adults in every area of our life. But sometimes we don't feel like it. And I, I got a meme for you. A meme's a picture with words on it. And I want you to look at this and think about this. I, I think we all can relate to this. I walk around like everything is fine, but deep down inside, in my shoe, my socks are falling off. <laughs> you know, if you, you, that's a terrible feeling, right? That's one of the worst feelings ever, especially if you're in the middle of a message and you're trying, you, you know, you're trying to get through stuff, and that's a terrible feeling. But, you know, sometimes we, on our image on the outside, we try to portray that everything's fine, but we know if we're all honest with each other, that inside some socks are falling off somewhere and some things are happening. So this series is about trying to get us to pull our socks up to be big boys and big girls, and we all need coffee to do that. So the next one, uh, Dustin informed me that you know a meme has to have a picture. So we got a picture with the words here as well. Drink some coffee and pretend you know what you're doing, right? How many of you have been there before where you didn't really know what you're doing, but you're trying to figure it out as you go? I think every one of us are, you know, we're still trying to figure out this adulting thing. I'm 60 years old, and man, uh, if you could have seen me dancing with my grandkids yesterday, you, you will know that certainly there are some things I have not figured out. <laughs> but we had a great weekend together with our family, and we thank God for that. So today, we're talking about purpose, and uh, our theme verse for the whole series is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. It says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reason like a child, but when I became a man, an adult, I put oh, an end to childish ways. So this series is about trying to getting the childish ways out of our life, not, not the, out of our lives, not the good things about childhood like loving people and trusting and being happy and joyous and laughing, but the things that make us immature. So we're trying to mature in Christ. So today we want to talk about purpose, and purpose is the reason for which something exists. Purpose, the dictionary definition, is the reason that something 
exist. You know, you ever hear people say, you know, that person was born to blank. All right, I'm going to give you a few names, and I want you to yell out to me if you know this person and what they were born to do from a, an apparent point of view. Okay, LeBron James was born to what? Play basketball, right? Garth Brooks was born to? To sing country music, right? Uh, okay, this is a little harder for some of us older ones, maybe, but I think in the region that we live, we'll probably figure it out since we're in Wilkes County. Danica Patrick was born to? Drive fast, right? Some of you are thinking, I was born to drive fast. I just don't get paid money to do that, you know? Uh, Billy Graham was born to preach the gospel. Dustin and Elise Serrano were born to sing. You know, we're so thankful for them and for the team that we have here every week. And so when we look at people on the outside and just a sort of a a cursory look, a, a simple look at a person we can say, oftentimes, that person was born to do certain things. But what we need to understand is our purpose is far bigger than just the things that we do. It's about who we are. And my purpose is bigger than conflicting desires. Now, you need to understand this. No matter how adult you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how mature you are, that no, I wish it was different. I wish I could say, look, I turned 60 last December and now I figured it out and I don't have any conflicting desires. But that's just not true because the Bible teaches that there's a thing as our flesh, that part of us that resists the plan and the will of God. And then there's the spirit of God who lives inside of a believer who pulls us a different way. And you need to understand whatever those conflicting desires are in your life and our, in our society today, particularly in America in these days, a lot of people are saying, look, whatever those desires are, you need to just play them out, no matter what God says about them. And the conflicting desires, we've been taught nowadays that those conflicting desires, if that's the way you feel, then just go for it, follow your heart, just do whatever comes natural. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that we are built with conflicting desires, desires that from the flesh side of things, from the, the evil side of things, they're pulling us in one direction, and the Spirit of God working inside of us is pulling in a different direction. And here's the thing you need to understand. As a Christian, we're not called to follow our heart. In fact, would you write that down? I will not follow my heart. One of our staff members last week, just because it was a cute shirt, uh, she had on a shirt with feathers on it and said, follow your heart. And we all joked about it because she knows better, but it was a pretty shirt. It was a cool shirt. But as Christians, if we're really mature, if we're adulting well, we understand the danger of simply following our heart. One of the verses I memorized early in life was Jeremiah 17, 9. It says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, see, we've tried to redefine the sickness that the Bible calls sin today and make everything all right. But God says when you follow your heart and you follow the desires of your flesh, that part of you that goes against what God's said in his word and the way that God says he's designed you, that we always get into trouble. And every one of us do. We get into trouble. There's conflicting desires. And we are bigger than our conflicting desires. Our purpose is bigger than that. And if we follow our heart, we will get in trouble. Now, let me ask you something. What would you do with your life? What would you pursue if money was absolutely no object? Think about that for just a minute. Let that sink in. If I had all the money in the world and I could write checks for, I could use my card for, I had a credit card with unlimited resources and I could go do anything that I wanted to do, what would you pursue? What would you pursue if money was no object? If you could do anything in the world and money was no object, what would you pursue? This morning we're going to look at somebody who fit into that description. His name is Solomon. Some of you have heard of him before. The Bible says he was one of the wisest men that ever lived, but he still wasn't perfect. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Ecclesiastes. you got in the very center of your Bible, you open to the center, you've got Psalms. Then to the right, just a little bit, you've got Proverbs. The next book after Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this. As you're turning there, I'm just going to remind you 
Solomon was offered anything he wanted by God. I'll give you your heart's desire. And he asked for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. Well, Ecclesiastes is a book in one of the, what we call the wisdom writings in the Scripture. And so he's, at the end of his life, he's writing this book, if you will, it's an autobiography. And he's telling us about his quest in life and what he discovered in his quest. Now, the thing about history is either you can repeat the same mistakes that our forefathers have made, have made in history and your family and your parents and your grandparents. You can repeat the same mistakes and not learn from history, or you can learn from history and change. Solomon gives us an opportunity to avoid some of the mistakes that he made as one of the wisest and richest men that ever lived. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 1 says this, The words of the preacher, so among other things, he was, he was a king, he was a leader, he was a world figure, he was wealthy, but he was a preacher. He was a person who proclaimed what he had learned. He was the one that preached a message from the life lessons that he had learned. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, I want you as a project this week, if you will, if you don't have your own plan for your devotion, or even if you do, if you can supplement this week, by studying the book of Ecclesiastes, I think you'll benefit greatly. Because on Sunday, we can just give you like a thumbnail snapshot. But if you can go home and study this book this week, I think you will learn so much from Solomon's quest for knowledge and for wisdom and for finding purpose and meaning in life. But as you do that, there's two really important phrases that you need to understand as you read the book of Ecclesiastes. The first one is vanity of vanities. Another way to say that is emptiness of emptiness. It's all futile. In his quest to find meaning in life, m most of the things that he sought after and bought after and went after with all of his heart left him still feeling empty and purposeless. But now another key phrase in the passage you, you read often is under the sun. The idea is this. Without God in the picture, if you don't bring God in the picture, and you, you have all the money in the world, and you can do anything you want, and you follow your heart, you're going to end up empty, vanity of vanities. But he said, this is the perspective under the sun. Above the sun is God. And when you bring God into the picture, it changes the whole perspective of every part of your life. So as you read the book of Ecclesiastes this week, keep those things in mind. Vanity of vanities means purposelessness, meaninglessness, emptiness is all that results from every pursuit under the sun without God in the picture. All right, so now I want you to, to take me to, uh, to, to go with me to chapter 2, just a, a next page over probably in your Bible, and look at some principles from this man named Solomon. Ecclesiastes 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 11, stopping along the way a bit to comment. Okay, so Ecclesiastes 2 verse 1 says this, I said in my heart, remember we said, don't follow your heart. Solomon, he's say, telling us some lessons he experienced early in life, and he said, I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. All right? Pleasure is a great gift from God, but it's a terrible God. If your God is pleasure and self-satisfaction, you're going to never be happy. You're going to never be satisfied. He said, I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. The whole idea of you only go around once in life, so grab all the gusto that you can. Remember that commercial, the beer commercial? He says, but behold, this also was vanity. He said, man, I set out on a quest to experience every pleasure known to man. But at the end of that study, I was still lonely. I was still empty. I was still unsatisfied. I still did not feel purposeful in my life. In verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad and pleasure, what use is it? So even laughter under the sun without God in the picture, the funniest jokes, the greatest entertainers in the world, all of this thing, it still left me flat. When I lie in bed at night at the end of a day, and all the pleasures that I've experienced and all the laughter that I've experienced still 
there was something missing. Verse 3, I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. Nowadays, we have all kinds, way more than they had in their day, I, I would assume, of alcoholic drinks and beverages and craft beer and all of these things. He said, man, I'm going to try them all. I'm going to try the craft beers. I'm going to try these kind. Of, I'm going to mix different things in. I'm going to try everything, and I'm going to cheer myself up with wine. My heart still got him he's with wisdom. So he's saying, I'm still trying to figure this out. I'm trying to look at all of these things with a heart of wisdom and how to lay hold on folly. In other words, how to find out what I'm doing wrong till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven the few days of their life. So one of the things he discovered at the end of his life, and those of you who are like me in the latter part of your life, on the back nine, if you would, we're on the back nine, some of us, and we're discovering that life is getting faster and faster, right? Every day goes faster. Every year goes faster. And Solomon said, I'm trying to figure all this out, and I'm taking wine in. I'm, I'm trying to see what good there is under heaven for the very few days. The Bible says they're like a vapor. And he says now, verse 4, this is where a lot of you kick in here with work. He said, I, I made great works. He, he was very entrepreneurial. He was very a hard worker. He, he tried. He was successful as well. He wasn't just a guy that tried and failed. This was a guy that was successful. He made great works. He built houses. He had a lake house. He had a beach house. He had a mountain house. He had everything you can imagine, every place you can imagine. And people came from all over the world to check out his properties. He said, I made houses. I planted vineyards for myself. Like in Cape Town, South Africa, or in California, the beautiful vineyards. And he planted vineyards, and he looked at all the vineyards, and they were very fruitful and productive. He says, uh, I, I made all of these things for myself. I was very productive with my life and with my chronos and my kairos, opportunities that we talked about last week. Verse 5, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. So he had like... National forest and preservations and fruit, fruit forest and vineyards. He planted all kinds of fruit, trees and vines. Verse 6, I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. So he had all kinds of pools, probably swimming pools, but most importantly here in the context is irrigation pools. He said I could keep everything. You know, I'm having trouble even growing grass in my yard, right? This tree, there's trees everywhere. I can't get grass to grow anywhere. If any of you are real knowledgeable on that, I could really use your help. I've got to get my soil right. I can't even grow grass. This guy, he had irrigation plants and fields. I remember my grandfather when he was growing uh, on the farm when he was alive, uh, he, had a, he had two ponds. And he would run these irrigation pipes. Some of you who've done farming, how many of you ever seen irrigation pipes on a farm? They, they run it down the farm, they, they crank up this generator, and it pumps the water up to the fields, and then these, ch -ch 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 -ch, it's watering the fields. And some nowadays, you see these fields that are like 200, 300 yards wide, and they've got this wide irrigation system that's going through, keeping everything wet and watered. Solomon had all of that. He said he made pools of waters for growing trees. Verse 7, I bought male and female slaves. He had all kinds of employees, indentured servants, as you will, people that would help him and work and plant the, the soil and water and irrigate. And I had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions. We, we read in the scriptures that the Queen of Sheba came to see his vast resources and because he, he had a global reputation and when she got there, she said, man, not even a half has been told about really what you have. I had great possessions uh, of herds and flocks, more than any who had been with me in Jerusalem. I also gathered myself silver and gold. We talked last week uh, about a gold bar. It was worth like a half a million dollars. Well, Solomon had gold and silver, treasures that kings love to look into. The treasure of kings and provinces. He had all kinds of rubies and diamonds and gold and silver. I got singers. He had entertainment. He had entertainers. Come to his house anytime he want. He had the best of the best. He had singers and entertainers, both men and women, and many concubines. He had a harem. Some of the decisions that he made, we said... <laughs> Not the wisest decision. 700 concubines, 300 wives. 
Solomon had. I don't understand how the wisest man in the world could be so foolish on some things, right? You ever think that about yourself? Like, how could I make such dumb decisions? Okay, the delight of the sons of men. So he had entertainers and clowns and mimes and people that did all kinds of entertaining for him. Number nine, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. So he still could make some good decisions and he made good investments and so forth. But he made some poor and some sinful decisions along the way as well. Now, he said something in verse 10 that I don't, I doubt that anybody here today, probably nobody even watching online, could say. I'm not sure, but I think that's probably pretty safe to say. Look at verse 10. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart, I kept from my heart, I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. He said, man, whatever I wanted, I got it. Now, I wouldn't want to make some of the mistakes he made, but wouldn't it be fun, even just for a day, if you could take your wife shopping or your friends shopping or your children shopping, and you got an unlimited credit card, and you can go anywhere. Yeah, you want that? Get that. You want that? Get that. And, you know, we, we all know a few weeks later, you'd still find something else you wanted, and you'd be unhappy. It wouldn't bring happiness to you. But Solomon said... Everything that I wanted was mine for the asking. He was a king. He was a leader. He was an entrepreneur. He had all kinds of money and resources. And whatever his eyes desired, he didn't keep from them. He had no restrictions on what he could buy. For my heart found pleasure in my toil, and this was my reward for my toil. So he said, there was some good things. It was rewarding to look and see the things that I worked for come to fruition. The vineyards grow and the trees grow and all the houses being built. That was rewarding. But look at the next verse, verse 11. Then I considered that all my hands, that all my hands had done and all the toil I had experienced in doing it. And behold, all was vanity. I still felt empty. It didn't. Scratch the inner itch in my heart. It didn't meet my real need. Then I considered all my hands had done, the toil I'd experienced in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind. Dust in the wind. Remember that song by Kansas? I hear that song, and it's a really pretty melody and guitar piece, but I'm thinking, I wonder what the guy who wrote that song, I've never researched it to see what he thought, but what a sad refrain. Dust in the wind, it's all dust in the wind. All we are is dust in the wind. Solomon, the, one of the wisest, one of the most wealthy men that had ever lived, after playing with it all, And having all the toys said it was empty. It was striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And then you don't have to look there now. But if you flip to the very end of Ecclesiastes, this is near the beginning. At the end, he talks later about education. And you students who just graduated, we're going to honor you next week from college and from high school. He says something interesting that you all laughed at. He, he said, when you think about exam time and stuff, he said, uh, of making many books, making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. <laughs> it wore me out. You know, final exams just wore me out. And so read the book, and then he comes to the end, and he says, let's hear the conclusion. I've studied it all. I've done it all. I've had it all. I've been everywhere. I've done everything. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. And I've done it all. And he said, here's the conclusion I came to. Listen. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. In other words, love God. Have a relationship with God. Do what he tells you to do. That's the only thing that can satisfy you. And listen, there's a lot of people in church that are still trying the things that Solomon's tried. Pleasure and wine, women and song and money and entertainment and pleasure. And and those things in themselves 
if, if they're not in a, a contrast to what the Word of God says, uh, God gives us blessings to enjoy, but they're great benefits and blessings, but they're terrible gods. They're terrible gods. Sex is a great gift from God within the bonds of marriage as God designed it to be, but it's a horrible God. And he said, listen, fear God and keep his commandments. Do you realize that God, in, in looking at our hearts, and he can see our hearts. He can see our hearts that are evil. It reminds me of a joke I heard this week. I thought it was really funny. Hopefully you will too. There was these two men in a church, and they seemed to be good men on the outside. They had great personalities, you know, outwardly, but... The people that really knew them knew that they were evil, wicked, womanizing men that squandered money and got drunk on the weekends. And they, they were two-faced. They kind of presented themselves one way, like we talk about character and, and, and image. But really deep down, they were evil men. Well, this new pastor came into town. And uh, soon after he did, one of the evil brothers died. And they were in the middle of a building project. And you know, these guys had lots of money and they... They were kind of like Solomon. They had a lot of cash. And so one of the brothers came to him and said, look, I want you to do my brother's funeral. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay off the building program for the church. I'm going to write a big check. I'm going to give it to you. And you can pay off the whole building program that we're working on. But there's one proviso. And he said, you have to say that my brother was a saint. Wow. Tough one, huh? Not really. But in the joke, it goes this way. All right, so he said, okay, I'll do it. No problem, I'll do it. So he got the check. He went and cashed it, paid off the building program. The funeral came up a few days later, and he gets up there, and he starts blasting the brother that had died. He said he was an evil man. He was a womanizer. He was a drunkard. He was a drug abuser. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> There's a little wisdom in that, in that arrangement, right? But you know what? There's a lot of people that on the outside appear to be saints, but they're not following God with their heart. And even though we can come here and we can worship and we can even serve, we can give money. Here's what Amos says. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Amos chapter 5. We're going to be there for just a couple of seconds. Chapter 5 of Amos, way back in the Old Testament, verses 21 to 24. He talks about people like that. People who, on the outside, they make a showing and they have an image, but they really aren't loving God. And by the way, I want to say something. I love the, what, the way we do worship, and I'm learning how to worship better. And sometimes in the songs, they build in a quiet moment where the, the band plays and there's no words. And if you grew up like me, you kind of get nervous in that time. Like, hey, why don't we sing? We need to sing. We need to sing. We need to do something. But those are built in purposefully into the songs so that we have a rest moment to just worship God in our heart. To praise him with our hands. To be thinking about the, what we've just sung about. And so let's all build into our minds and our hearts these pauses that are built into our music to worship God. And so, But if we don't and we worship God on the external, but we're not being changed on the inside. Here's what God thinks about it. In Amos chapter 5, verse 21, says this. I hate, I despise your feast. Now, we can say potluck dinners, if you will. Or even life group, where you eat together. And just hang with me, and let's figure out what he's saying here. I hate, I despise your feast. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. God's saying to these people who outwardly were doing the right things, he says, I even hate it when you get together in a big assembly. Verse 22, even though you offer me your burnt offerings, put something in the offer plate, or you serve somewhere in the church, or you're in the band, or you're preaching on the stage, or whatever. He says, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. What? It doesn't mean anything to God. Why? Here's what he says. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. So all the good things you're doing and the money you're throwing in the plate and trying to buy off the God with your giving, but your heart is still wicked. He said, I'm, I'm not going to accept them. I'm not going to look upon them. They make me sick to look at. Verse 23, take away from me the noise of your songs. Oh, my goodness. When you sing out in worship and your heart is 
not even trying to be right with God. He says, it's just noise to me. Take away the noise of your songs. Shut up. It's really what God's saying. Shut up. Now, he's not saying you have to be perfect to worship, but he's saying if your heart is not anywhere close to being pursuing after God and getting things right in your life, and you're just making an outward show, just be quiet. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. They had these beautiful harps and the instruments that were playing, and God says, just stop it. It sounds like they're out of tune, even though they aren't. But, verse 24, let justice roll down. Justice is being right with God and doing the right things. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God says, I want your heart. I don't just want the external. I don't want you just to make a show here. I don't want you to just put money in the plate or be in the service or be on the stage or preach a message. I want all of you because I've made you for a purpose. And it's not to follow your heart and your conflicted desires inside of you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 11, verse 17, these words, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for better, but for the worse. Now, this is in the context of communion, the Lord's table. When you take the, the juice and you take the bread and you remember the blood of Jesus Christ and you remember the body that was broken for you, he says, you're coming together for this, but he says, when you leave, you're in worse shape than when you came. Because you're not listening. You're not repenting. You're not changing. You're not letting God change you from the inside out. And when you gather, you, you leave with more knowledge in your head, but less application in your life, and you leave in worse condition. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So I will not follow my heart. I will not follow the conflicting desires of my heart that go against what God and his morals and his word says. I'm going to instead, I will follow Jesus. Would you write that down? I'm not going to follow my heart. I'm going to follow Jesus. So the first part of the message was about born to be wild. Remember that Steppenwolf song? Some of you are old enough to remember Steppenwolf. Some of you maybe remember that in, in music today in the oldies station. 1968, Steppenwolf writes a song, Born to be Wild, and it's talking about motorcycles, and it, it talks about um, uh, iron, uh, me heavy metal. It's talking about the motorcycle, but they say that this was really the first heavy metal song because it referred to that, but also the, the genre of the music and, and sort of then... Uh, they, they made movies where that song was the, the, the key song in the movie, uh, the movie Easy Rider, 1969. Some of you are like, 1969? That was before they had, uh, they had wheels, right? That was, that was a long time ago. Well, some of you remember this, you know? And so this first heavy metal song, and they, they made the movie Easy Rider about motorcycles. So now, a lot of times when you see motorcycles riding, they're playing that, and Sean just got a motorcycle, and he's probably listening to Steppenwolf in his helmet, all right? All right, so... Uh, Step, the first part of it was about born to be wild, but that's in our unredeemed, unsaved state. As sinners, our hearts will lead us astray. And we're not born, as a Christian, we're not born to be wild, but we're born to be God's child. Not born to be wild, but born to be God's child. I will follow Jesus. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says this, that I may know him, God. Jesus Christ. He said, this is the purpose for my life. Remember, Paul was a, a violently opposed critic of Jesus Christ and persecutor of Christians before he met Jesus. His life was radically changed. And when it was changed, he said, my one sole purpose in life, my purpose, my reason for being is that I may know him, Philippians 3.10. And the power of his resurrection. He can change you from the inside out. He can change your character. He can help you get the big rocks first in your life. He can change and transform you inside out. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection. And may share in his sufferings. Are you willing to suffer persecution for Jesus? Even if it's not being in the most popular group. Because you know that they stand for things that you don't. 
that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings because becoming like him in his death, dying to ourself, dying to those conflicting desires inside of us, those desires that tend to lead us astray when we follow our heart instead of following God. And then Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7, God promises to the nation of Israel and to every individual who will surrender to him and believe in him. He says this in Jeremiah 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. Solomon ended well. He, he had this period in his life where he, he wasn't so sure. He tried just a few too many things. He adopted a few too many sinful pleasures into his life, and he came to the end. He said, look, let me save you some trouble. Let me help you. Young people, college students, high school, mom, dad, senior citizens, listen. No matter how much you make, no matter how much you experience, nothing will bring you satisfaction but Jesus Christ. And God says to you today and to me, return to me. Return to me. I am your reason for being. One of the great statements of the faith um, says this, man's chief end, in other words, his main reason for being, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Man's chief end, your primary reason, your primary purpose for being is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, John Piper, modern day theologian, he says, that he, he tweaks it just a little bit, and I like what he says. He says, man's chief end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. What's the thing that makes God's heart more happy, most happy? When you follow him. When I follow him. When I enjoy him. When the greatest pleasures of my life come from spending time alone with God. Some of you, for some of you, that's a foreign concept. Some of you listening online or the podcast or watching, some of you, that's a foreign concept that there could be pleasure in a relationship with God. Because you're just picturing the rules and the the, the prohibitions and following your heart and the joy that that will bring. But Solomon said, look, I tried it all. Let me give you a piece of advice. Honor God. Enjoy God. Not the pursuit of pleasure in other things primarily, but the pursuit of pleasure in God. So I'm going to give you a, a few takeaways for today. Following Jesus, if you write this down, following Jesus, I will practice his presence. That means I'm going to try to get to know him. I'm going to practice his presence. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to practice his presence everywhere I go. When I'm in college, when I'm in school, when I'm at the gym, when I'm in the neighborhood, when I'm on my motorcycle playing Born to be Wild, I'm going to pursue God with all my heart. Following Jesus, I will practice his presence through three things. Number one, faith in what he has said and who he is. I'm going to believe his word. I'm going to believe what he said about himself. I'm going to believe what he's revealed about himself. I'm going to have faith in God. And even when it doesn't seem to make sense, I'm going to believe God no matter what. Number two, following Jesus, I'll practice his presence through continual repentance for my sin. You say, what's that? It means when God speaks to my heart about a pleasure, a conflicting desire, and I'm being pulled this way and the Holy Spirit's pulling me this way, that I say no to the devil in my flesh, and I say yes to Jesus. When he says, don't, you've, you just had one too many, stay away from that, I'll follow you. When God says, leave those things alone that you're being coming addicted to, and follow me. When God says, this is a conflicting desire, and I've told you about it, stay away from it, and the Holy Spirit says, follow me in a different direction, we say, I do. I will. We saw a young man yesterday of character say, I do, to his now bride. And she said, I do. Every day following Jesus is faith in him and continual repentance for my sin. That's, repentance means this. Just watch me. I'm walking this way. Repentance is a 180. I turn from following and trusting myself and following and pursuing pleasure for its, as an end in itself. And I'm going to follow God with my whole heart by continually turning away from repenting of Sin in my life. 
And thirdly, following Jesus, our practice is presence through obedience to his word and to his spirit. His word gives us lots of things that tell us how to deal with our conflicting desires. And where our conflicting desires will lead us or where he will lead us. And we have to choose to follow him and be obedient to what his word says and what his spirit, how his spirit leads. Another way to say it is this. God is most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him. Can I ask you a real penetrating question? Are you satisfied in God? Now, I know there's, for those of us who are growing in Christ, there's, there's a sense in which we are satisfied and we're content and we can rest in him and we can trust in him. But there's always that sense of wanting to grow more. That's biblical. To grow and mature, to be adulting better as a Christian. But there should be this overwhelming sense for every Christian who's truly trying to follow Christ with their heart. That says, God, I'm satisfied with you. If, and I, here's what I said to my kids when, we, when they were growing up. When we were missionaries and we've been in ministry all our life. They, they, had, they didn't have a lot of the toys that a lot of people had. They had all that they need. But here's what I said to my kids. Listen. If God never did anything else for you in your whole life but draw you to himself, save you from hell, and give you a relationship with him, you'd never have any reason to complain. Do you have that attitude? That God, no matter what I don't have, God, I am satisfied in me, in you. I'm, you're most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in you. So, as a Jesus follower, I will make him known to others. So, if he's the most important quest in our life, not only are we going to be satisfied in him, but we're going to tell it to other people. I will make him known with my life and with my lips. Here's what Paul said about his desire in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. If I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. In other words, i got to do it. He's the most important part of my life. He's everything to me. And he says, it's necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul said, I want to know him. That's my greatest quest. And right in line with that is, I want to make him known. So as a next step today... Would you write this down? I, I was born to, is, is the idea, not born to be wild, but born to be God's child. And because I'm born to be his child, I will know Jesus and make him known. You can save yourself a lot of trouble and grief, young people, as you start out your life. Those of you that are graduating from high school and then moving on to college. Moms and dads, some of us still haven't be, become very good at adulting in this way. Is that Jesus is the greatest pursuit of our life. Some of you used to pursue him, but now somehow you've gotten twisted, angry, bitter, unforgiving. You've let sin slip into your life. And now that sweetness that you used to enjoy of fellowship with God has been replaced by bitterness and anger and resentment and unforgiveness and living in the past. For the Christian, the good old days are still ahead. Amen? Amen. Let's follow Jesus with our whole heart. Look, I have no way have I been perfect. But God saved me as a child, and he, he made himself real to me. And I can say to you that all of my life, even though I struggle with things and I, I battle with things, and I have to continue to go before God, he has been the joy of my life and the satisfaction of my heart. And I would say to you wholeheartedly, like Solomon says, follow Jesus. Know him and make him known. Would you pray with me? Maybe there's someone here today who's never trusted Christ as your Savior. You've never asked him to come into your life and forgive you of your sins and put your faith and trust in what he did on the cross and dying for your sins and being buried and rising again. Hey, listen, you, most of you are old enough to have discovered a lot of disappointments in life so far. That things that you thought would really bring you joy and contentment and satisfaction and happiness and great, great pleasure have tended to be greatly disappointing. Can I refer you to Jesus? He wants to know you 
He wants you to know him and make him known. He wants to come into your life and fill you with his peace and his joy and his presence, forgiveness of sin. And if you're here today or you're listening online and you've never received him, would you just cry out to him right now in your seat something like, Dear God, I'm not satisfied. I need you, God. I've tried things that have been conflicting in my soul and pulled me in the wrong direction away from me, but now, Lord, I repent. I turn to you. I'm not trying to clean up my act, God, because I don't even know how to do that. But I turn to you and I say, God, you do it. Come into my life. Become my Savior. Give me your joy. I want to pursue you. If you prayed that prayer today, would you slip up your hand? Even if you're in your home. Yes, thank you. I see a, I see a hand. Anyone else today? I pray to receive Jesus Christ. Hey, Amen. Anyone else? Saw so one hand. Any others? There will be people out these double doors that can meet you and take you and talk to you about your decision for Christ and help you to understand it further. When we sing, you're welcome to meet them out in the hallway. Talk to them. They'll be there for you. Let me talk to Christians for just a minute. Somehow deep down inside, you know this message is true, but somehow you've gotten off the path and those conflicting desires have led you in the wrong direction. And it's time for a change. It's time to return to me, God says. Return to him. And there's things that you need to repent of. Attitudes, heart conditions, sinful relationships, addictions. And today you'll say, God, I, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied. And I'm turning to you. And God, turn me around today. Would you hold up your hand if that's you this morning? I'm dealing with something. Yes, I see a number of hands throughout the building. Anyone else? I'm dealing with something I need to give to God. And you give it to him today and you'll never be sorry when you stand before him that you did what he asked you to do today. Would you do what he's asking you to do and what you'll be glad you've done when you stand before him in heaven, in eternity. Lord God, help us to do today what you call us to do. Thank you for the salvation of the one soul who trusted Christ. Thank you for those who are making decisions to follow you, to pursue you with their whole heart. And Lord, to mature in their faith, to adult well in their faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.